and I would like to welcome everybody to another episode of Got Transition Radio. I'm here with my co-host, Eileen Ferlenza, and this show is brought to you by the National Healthcare Transition Center. Uh, we had a super great turnout on our last episode, and I hope that we have some return listeners and some new listeners as well. So Eileen, why don't you take a minute and say hello to everyone and kind of catch us up with what you've been doing since we last talked. Well, hi, everyone. I hope that you are enjoying this beautiful fall weather. I'm here in Colorado, and we actually have a blizzard today, so it's always fun to know what's going on across the country. Uh, you know, since the last time we talked, I've had uh, some wonderful opportunities to talk with families, and uh, I don't know what it is about the fall. I don't know if it's back to school time, but families are asking more and more about how do they better prepare themselves as a mom and a dad or a guardian, but also how do they prepare their children for a more independent way of life. Um, so just working with a lot of providers as well to help them feel like they have the capacity to answer questions for families. And um, you know, it's just, it's been a wonderful time to have this elevated awareness about this topic, about transitioning youth from the pediatric system to the adult healthcare system. And the more we talk about it and the more we are out in the community raising awareness about this issue, it's amazing how many people are coming forward who are continuing to ask questions and to offer resources for what we can do to identify gaps and close those gaps for families. Excellent. Thanks so much, Eileen. And you hit a really good point. Um, as it is fall and people are getting back into the groove of going back to school and probably a lot of people have had midterms and all that stuff by now. Um, and that's some of what we're going to be talking about on today's episode. Before we get into that and my stories about going to college, I want to remind everybody about some basic housekeeping rules and how to use the technology that's in front of you. During this broadcast and for every episode of Got Transition Radio, you have that webinar control panel on the right of your screen and you will see a chat window, and you can send messages this way either to the whole group or just to the presenters. Uh, you can also put your questions into the window that says questions, and Eileen and I will see everything you write in both of these places, and we'll be able to respond and comment on them throughout the show. And I don't want people to be shy, so feel free to comment, jump in the conversation, and ask anything that's on your mind. So we want the show to really be about you guys. So before we get started, I mean, do you have anything else that you want to add or think people should be aware of? Yeah, I want to touch for just a moment on the idea of transition and how, number one, how unique it is, but also I want to talk about the difference between transition and change, as well as the difference between transitioning the care to the actual transfer of care. And what we know and what I want to kind of frame today when we talk about the idea of transition is that transition is a process that we as individuals go through internally. How are we as parents dealing with our grief cycle? How are the, uh, our young adult children, how are they working with their sense of confidence and independence? So transition is kind of an inward process, whereas uh, you know, change is something that happens externally. The weather changes or our residence changes or where we live may change. So as we talk today, I, wanted to, I just want to kind of tee that up for our listeners to think about this as a transition when we're talking about youth transitioning from pediatric to adult systems of care as well as young adults transitioning from the public school kind of incubated system of, of delivery system and how then do we, do we work within a community-based system. Because what is known, regardless of these differences that I'm talking about, what I want to really drive home is that the process of transition is unique for everyone here. That it's a, it's a process by which, as an individual, you, you experience it, you create it, you develop it, and it's unique and different for all of us. And our jobs, as both myself as a parent, as well as someone who works in the system, is to honor the diversity of all of that that comes to the table when we're going to talk about the experience of youth transitioning from pediatric to adult health care. 
So that I wanted to, I've been thinking about that a lot today, getting ready for today's show, and, and I just really wanted to drive home the point to our listeners to understand that, Mallory, while you're sharing your story today, that's one story of many, and that we want to honor the experience and the differences that other people have experienced as they go through their successful path of transition. So thanks for giving me those few minutes to kind of um, get on my passionate plea, and I, I really am looking forward to today's show so we can talk about that. That's such a great point, and I could not have said it better myself. Um, I think sometimes when we talk about certain things like going away to college, people say, well, that's not my path, or that's not where my life is going to go. But I think it's important that we don't forget that transition does look different for everybody, and it's a journey. It's the way you live your life. It's something that's always happening. So although this is my story, it's only one example of transition, and they definitely come in all shapes and sizes. So let me kick this thing off and just say that for me, going to college was probably the hardest thing I have ever done. And when I started, I couldn't believe that this was what people were calling the best years of your life. So to all our listeners and young people out there, I want you to know that if you make a transition and it doesn't feel as fantastic and magical as everyone said it was going to, you're definitely not alone. And that's one of the realities, is that sometimes things that are exciting are also really hard and scary. So for me, when I was looking at schools, I had a lot of things that I had to think about because of my medical condition and my physical needs. And I knew I wanted to go to a school that was away from home, but I also knew, since I had never been on my own before, it probably wasn't the best choice to go too far away in case there was an emergency and I actually did need to get home. But if that were my choice to go farther away and out of state, we probably would have made that happen. But I knew I wasn't ready for that yet. And sometimes that's just another important step in transition is realizing where your limits are and what you might not be comfortable thinking about just yet. So once I had narrowed it down to a few schools, I made sure that I took tours of them with my class and through my high school so that I could actually see the campuses and what it might be like for me to get around. I use a motorized scooter to get around big places like that, uh, campus and airports and things like that. So accessibility was a huge piece that I needed to think about. And it will be for lots of young people looking to go to school who have physical needs or different kind of needs that have to do with the environment. So knowing that and knowing how much harder it would be, since in Maine we get several feet of snow every winter, um, Maine winters are definitely not disability friendly. So that was something I also had to consider. And taking those tours was something that was helpful and for some, it was enough to wipe those schools right off my list, uh, but that helped me narrow my choices down even more. There was one school that had a building with the library, and there was an elevator in the library, but only stairs to get to it, and lots of stairs all over the landscaping and the campus, so that one didn't last too long. The school I did end up attending had some minor accessibility issues um, with the doors, not having buttons, um, and it was challenging for me to open them. But after some advocacy work and speaking to the facilities management, um, by my second semester, they had put buttons on all the doors on campus and specially coded my ID so that when I scanned it to get into my dorm, the door opened for me automatically. So they were really willing to listen to what I needed and actually made those changes while I was still there to appreciate them. So that was great. I wonder if our listeners can add any experiences with thinking about the physical access of a campus. Um, has anybody been through that experience or known someone who had challenges with going away to school and not being able to get around? Um, what was important for you when you were thinking about go to, going to school? Um, we would love to hear any input that you may have. Um, Eileen, what are your thoughts on that? Um, do you have anything to say about the physical access of school? Yeah, I think physical access that we that you've described is the one I think we're all mostly familiar with in terms of stairs and curb cuts and things like that. But I think physical accessibility can also mean access to public transportation, um, access also to a uh, 
the, the easy and best route for first responders if you have a chronic health care need and you need to uh, call 911 or go to an urgent care, what kind of access is available in that manner. Um, you know, I think what's really important, as it sounds like you probably did, Mallory, is, um, you know, I think it's, it's nothing to be ashamed of or nothing to feel like, oh, you're asking too much, but for young adults to begin to ask, well, what do you need? And what kind of physical uh, accessibility strategies would make your college situation that much more successful? So for someone to be able to talk about some accommodations they need, it might not be that kind of more typical, you know, Americans with Disabilities Act kind of thing that you've described with stairs, elevators, curb cuts, but also about access to books on tape or maybe access to what we knew in our high school years as 504 regulations and protections. It would be, uh, you know, having access to test mechanisms that are not timed or having access to an interpreter if you're not a, uh, if English is not the first language. So I think accessibility is a great place to start the conversation in terms of empowerment and how young people going off to college can begin to understand that they have a voice in this issue. And I so love, Mallory, that you shared that uh, you worked with the university and they made some changes. And while you were there, that they obviously moved on it quickly and you were able to experience um, you know, the, the, the benefit of your own advocacy, which I think is phenomenal. So I think that um, un people understanding that accommodations are uh, available at the secondary education level and that um, we can really begin to ask for what we need in that way. So I hope yeah. that's helpful. And uh, again, yeah, I agree with you. If anyone has any examples or further insight, we'd certainly love to um, entertain that here during this 30-minute uh, show that we're doing now. And I think that's excellent, um, talking about accessibility and accommodations. Um, there are so many more accommodations and ways that the experience of going to school can be improved uh, for people with all kinds of challenges and disabilities. And so that's a really good point to discuss the next step um, that I took in my college searching process. Um, and so for me, I went to speak with the people in the Disability Services Office. And this is something that's called different things depending on where you go. Um, but please remember, it is a different facility than the health center, um, and their role is different. So the people within this office will help you figure out uh, what accommodations are available and what you may be able to access um, while you're at that school. So this is someone that you really want to build a connection with um, if you need to have those accommodations to make your learning experience more positive. So I visited the people in this office at my top two schools that I had narrowed it down to. And it was interesting how I got really different vibes from both people I spoke with. One of the people was extremely welcoming, energetic, wanted to hear all about me, and got me an on-spot tour of the most accessible dorm that I would be living in. And this was before I even really knew I was going there. But the way she treated me made me feel comfortable and that I could actually be successful at this school, and they wanted me to be successful. At the other office we visited, the lady had the complete opposite way of thinking and acting with me. I had my mother and my paraprofessional who had supported me in high school uh, during this uh, discussion so that we could all have the conversation and they could make sure that I remembered all the questions I needed to ask because this was really overwhelming for me. It was a big transition. But the woman looked at me snidely and said, you know, when you're in college, you won't have them with you. And in that moment, that one comment was enough to make me feel like that university did not want to support me. And honestly, I don't remember how the rest of the conversation went because that's what stood out in my mind. Wow, that's amazing. It's, um, it just blows my mind how different the attitudes can be and how much uh, we can feel that. You know, as a parent of a child with disabilities, I have always been pretty in tune with that 
in terms of uh, do these people even, I don't mean to sound like that, these people, I'm thinking, does this agency or this group of people, do they understand the contribution that people with differences bring to this situation and how they are, are an asset to the community in general? And um, yeah, I think it's interesting that what you described in terms of going to the Disability Accommodations Office, that's actually very similar to what we have, what, it, what parents and what students have experienced at the high school level would be kind of like analogous to that's the special education department, if you will. And at the college level, it's, it's really around accommodations and modifications. So I think that that's really, um, really interesting that that disabilities special student services office is often overlooked as a resource because, uh, you know, actually those offices can be an incredible source of resources for um, everything from social inclusion to uh, peer supports to what's going on in the community as well as what is going on actually on the, the campus itself. And, uh, you know, we've had, a, we've had a question from someone in the audience that's asking about social accessibility. And, um, you know, how do you get a feel for the energy of the other students on campus? And Mallory, I don't know if you want to touch on that. I talked about a little bit as a parent how I could kind of feel that within the agencies that I've accessed on behalf of my daughter, Holly. But I'm wondering if you want to address that question of yeah, social accessibility. Definitely. That's a super question. And I think that's another part that can really be um, fulfilled if you get yourself on the campuses and start visiting and start talking to people. Um, when I was able to get that tour of the dorm, it was led by some students who lived there um, and who were just so passionate about the university. And um, you can also sometimes sit in on classes that are going on and kind of see the dynamic between the students and the professors. and. Um, if you get a tour straight through the school, you can often, um, they're conducted by people who are on the campus residence council or whatever it's called at that school. Um, and so you'll be spending time with students who actually go there. Um, and sometimes you can eat a meal in the cafeteria or the um, food court or whatever. And it's, it's really, for me, it's a lot of times it's pretty easy to kind of feel that vibe and that energy of how um, students out of school can be. And of course, it's easy, um, you know, to, I, I don't want to, I don't mean generalize and say, well, every student that goes here is A, B, or C. Um, but you can definitely feel from spending time with uh, people who are participating in the university how you might um, fit in in that environment. I think that brings up, you know, another question that's come up here uh, from one of the listeners is about how do you handle that when you're going out of state and you don't necessarily have the opportunity when you're going out of state to, to have that more immediate accessibility in terms of getting a sense to uh, on the campus. So uh, one of the questions that's come up on the show here is uh, regarding coping mechanisms for out-of-state transitions and what are some of those. So I would like to answer that as a parent. Um, as a parent, I think that the transition obviously has to happen long before the day of or that season of uh, going out of state, which I think is an incredible accomplishment for any student, much less a student with special health care needs. So I think the coping mechanisms start early on and, um, you know, at again, in the sophomore, junior, senior year of high school. And I think that the coping mechanisms are different for all people, but I, uh, I know that for me with communicating with my college students, it really was an emphasis on uh, tradition. And uh, what I mean by that is that every, every morning, uh, I always knew that I would, uh, I'd have a text waiting from my daughter. Uh, my other daughter who does not have special health care needs. And similarly, every night we made sure that somehow we would connect every night before bed, which her bedtime is a lot different than my bedtime, but that it would either be a phone call or a text. So I think for, for me and my family, it was about preserving some traditions and uh, having that kind of life balance by connecting 
through some of those communication uh, traditions. So that's and how I would like to address it as a, as a parent. I don't know, if Mallory, if you have a comment. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And uh, we'll talk uh, a little bit more about that in our next episode. Um, because although I didn't go out of state, um, there were times that I felt really, really far away um, from my friends and family. And I'll share more um, about how that went for me and what I did. Uh, so we're going to take one more question uh, at this point, and then we're going to go on, and we'll have a time for a couple more before we end. But this question says, when beginning your college search process, were you provided with any printed materials to aid your search in finding an accessible campus or special health care considerations um, to inquire about? And I think that's a really good question. Um, for me, there was a lot of um, reviewing their websites, seeing what was available. And a lot of uh, schools, and I'd be surprised to not say all schools, have a section on their website of what's available for disability services um, and who to contact to get more information. Also, once you do visit the disability services office, that's where they have a lot of the uh, pamphlets and res resources about how to communicate um, with your professors. and your needs and what's available for accommodations and those things. So I would definitely recommend starting with websites. Um, I've also recently in my adventures of pursuing graduate school, I've Googled most accessible universities. And there's some really nifty stuff that's out there um, if you look into that as well. So um, that would be my answer to that. and. So at this point, I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience when we went to talk to the health center. And this was something that we did after going to the disability services office. And I had really narrowed down where I wanted to go. And it was one of the last things once I had really solidified that plan. So I made an appointment and went in with my parents and my support team um, to talk to the staff at the health center. We sit down and explain to them what I would need and what I might need their help with. And we also discussed what I would do in the case of an emergency. They were super helpful and receptive in this conversation. And they assured me that if there was something they weren't comfortable with handling, uh, they would most definitely call my regular providers to make sure um, we could all take the right steps. And it's interesting, because since that experience, um, doing work with the medical home, Eileen and I have had a lot of conversations about how, in that sense, uh, university health centers are sort of a medical home or can be if they're really well structured. Um, so Eileen, what are your thoughts on that? And also, I know you have some young adults who have transitioned um, and gone away to college. So do they have to think about all these things too, or is it just people who have disabilities and healthcare needs? Well, that's such a good question because uh, my child who has disabilities, and you know, Holly's 22, and going to college is not an option for her. She doesn't have the cognitive ability to function at that level. And so for her, that's not an option. But I have three other children, two of whom are uh, in college now. My daughter Emily is uh, studying for law school. And my son Cody is a junior in his undergrad, and I think that to your to your your absolute question is yes, they do need to know these things. Uh, disabilities, special health care needs or not, they need to understand where is the health center, and they need to understand some of the basic things that we talk about at the Got Transition National Center about having our young adults be wise healthcare consumers. And, and uh, whether your young adult, for those of you listening, whether your young adult has a special health care need or not, there are some core principles that are important for them to understand, such as do they know how to make their own health care appointment? Are they carrying their health insurance card with them in their backpack at all times? Do they understand what their responsibility is for copay when they go? And uh, so all of those things, my uh, eldest daughter, Emily, again, her first year of college ended up with, um, for whatever reason, recurring sinus infections and eye infections. And uh, we had to make sure that we had a clinic um, there on the campus that she could access because coming home was just not an option. 
And uh, so you do bring up a good point, and thank you for letting me share that, that, um, you know, transition into the adult health care system is not specific just for kids with special health care needs. It's complicated at times for all people. And it's really about our giving our young adults the tools that they need to be wise health care consumers to manage their health and their wellness at all times. So uh, I do think that's a great question, and I'm glad that, um, that you brought it up because sometimes for a young adult, they've never had to make their own appointments. They don't even understand what this insurance situation is. Uh, maybe uh, all of their lives, which is typical. I mean, I, as a parent of four children, I just kind of handle all that stuff. Um, I'm starting to learn more and more about how to help my 13-year-old be more proactive so that he understands when we have a health care appointment. I show him the insurance card. I show him where it says copay. I showed him on the back what the phone number is. So. Uh, understanding the whole concept of insurance plans and what that means and how that's different, that uh, can be different than the health center, the health clinic that's on campus. So, um, yeah, I know, I'm sorry I'm rambling here, but I think it's important to understand how, in, how critical it is for our young adults to be wise healthcare consumers regardless of their health status. Excellent. And I, and I don't think you're rambling. I think that's such a relevant piece of it and uh, we could definitely add that to our list of future episodes just about young adults and having health coverage because I think when we think about being aware of our health and taking responsibility, I know at least in my experience that has been one of the most frustrating, overwhelming tasks uh, to date and even though I am knee deep in this world of advocacy and policy and helping other people figure out how to take care of all that, sometimes I still have a hard time myself. So I think it's great that that um, is brought up and we can definitely have a whole episode just about that. So on that note, um, I'm going to answer one more question uh, that we had and then I think we're going to have to start wrapping up because time sure does go quickly on these things. Mm -hmm. uh, one more question that I got was if I was able to meet other students with disabilities, uh, at that university before I started attending? That's a really interesting question. For me, I didn't investigate that so much. Um, I knew there were a couple of other people with disabilities who went there and were able to get around OK and, and get things done. But there wasn't a huge disability community at my school. I think if that is something that's important to you, asking the Disability Services Office uh, what is available to interact with other students, talk about their experiences with accommodations, how that's gone for them, what's worked for them, what has been challenging. I would definitely address that in that meeting or maybe even email admissions ahead of time and say that that's something that you're interested in. So that's a very interesting question and I think it's definitely possible, especially at much larger university universities, excuse me, that have much bigger uh, populations of people with disabilities. So on that note, uh, we will wrap up. And those are some of the steps that I did take in preparing for college. And I thought I was really ahead of the game. Uh, however, if you tune in to our next show and I continue my story, I, we will all find out about how far I really had left to go and how sometimes you have to fall to be able to get back up again. And those are some of the strongest learning experiences. Um, but some quick reminders, uh, after we sign off, please take a couple of minutes and fill out the simple evaluation that you will get uh, immediately following this webinar. And we had somebody jump in and ask if we had a Facebook account and a Twitter. Uh, we do not have a Twitter yet. It is in the planning stages, uh, but I am a huge fan and that will be happening. And as you can see right there, there's a link to our Got, Got Transition website and our Facebook page. So if you find us on Facebook and like us, you will be able to get updates about all the radio shows, about what Got Transition is doing, and uh, some resources about uh, health transition and advocacy and things like that. So please like us. and. 
also feel free to use that as an outlet to contribute questions or feedback uh, that you may not have been able to give at this time and all of that will be referred to by Eileen and myself and will be used to brainstorm future episodes and referred to as these shows happen. Um, so with that, I would like to thank you all for tuning in and please put the next show on your calendar, uh, which I believe is going to be November 30th, 3 o'clock Eastern Time. Um, and mark that and you will get updates uh, as you register. And thank you again for tuning in. And remember, every transition is unique, just like you. Thank you.